So uh, today uh, we have an amazing uh, tale of two cities that you will be, you will be hearing from Dr. Patra. Uh, Dr. Ivasmita Patra, who she prefers her friends and colleagues call her dead. Okay? Okay, Dr. Patra is a social scientist uh, whose research focuses on a very vital actually interface between science, technology, and society social culture, social ethics, and so on. It's really, it has become even more critical these days to really the tools, devices, technologies, and approaches that we are developing. And we are thinking that we want that to be ultimately to be implemented to have that social acceptance, social cultural fitness, and so on. Really, uh, Dr. Petra plays a critical role in that regard. In our department, all our environmental science uh, work that we are doing, if any practices, for example, to take just today, practices that we are uh, advising in many levels that they should use in order to secure the ecosystem health, human health, and so forth, if they don't have social stakeholder acceptability, then that's really one of the clues that we take. So with that, that's really the, the critical area that she's working on. Uh, I have lots of uh, information here about her, but I want to really summarize. Uh, first of all, uh, her background, uh, Dr. Petra received her BS in sociology from uh, Lake Shaw uh, Autonomous College in uh, Chutak, India. I hope I'm pronouncing those correctly. She received two master's degrees. One uh, Master of Philosophy in Sociology uh, in 2004, and prior to that, the Master's in Arts and Sociology in 2003 from the University of um, uh, Hyderabad in India as well. And then after that, she, to master, she continued on her PhD at the same institution and received her PhD in 2008. And she came to US and became a postdoc from 2008 to 2011 with uh, Cornell Nano State Facility at Cornell University up in, uh, in Ithaca. And then since then, I think, you know, it does as far as sort of move people. So when they came about in Dr. Krakhan, who is a professor in between the of Science, when he came to Maryland, so then came to this region, she has been, she has played many different roles she has been affiliated uh, with Center for Critical uh, Clinical. Uh, let's see, I got to do it in all the eyes. Uh, Biotech, Georgetown University, 2013 to 2017, as some professor with, with the science program, University of Maryland, University College, our neighbor here. And 2017 to 2020, as some professor, again, the science uh, program. The global campus. It's really the same campus, but we changed the name to global campus. And she has she was also a PTK uh, from 2007-2018, the Department of Communication at UND. And finally, uh, 2021, uh, she has uh, she has been said until now, she is an associate member in the Science Data uh, Center uh, in at UND as well besides being PTK in our department since 2019 as a uh, research assistant research and scientist. Uh, she is, again, she has a PTK category. She's teaching courses. Currently, she's teaching a course on, on diversity, equity, inclusion, and respect. Last semester, she taught a course in uh, 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 eco ecological and natural resource ethics. Uh, in fact, uh, she asked me to be the uh, to be the guest lecture on AI and, and ethics uh, area for her students. So uh, she received uh, the Departmental uh, Excellence in Research Award in uh, uh, I believe it was in this year, 2021. She has been she has several fantastic publications, many conference presentations, and lots of social media highlights about her research. Not only the technology interface in the ecosystem environmental area, but also in food labeling and many other areas too, in order to get used to food waste. 
I was looking at some of those slides. It's just amazing. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to give the doctor a cut down, and she's going to tell you a couple of tales or tales of two cities. <laughs> Uh, if we are done with the presentation for today, um, thank you, Professor Simulzmati, for your kind words. That means a lot to me. And uh, it does a pressure in me with it now that how I'm going to perform today in the presentation. But uh, anyway, as Professor Simulzmati said, I'm going to talk about two specific bay watersheds in our work, what we have been doing in the past two years and what we have learned in the process. Um, just to, uh, okay, just to give you a little background on our study, this is an NSF funded project uh, under the couple nature and human systems, which is basically to look at the interaction between nature and uh, human beings, how they are interacting and interfering and uh, trying to help or not help each other. Under that program, we uh, discuss about water management in general and specifically on uh, green infrastructure or storm water management and how that is uh, going on in those uh, areas. Um, for that, we chose two Chesapeake Bay water sets which were failing in terms of jurisdiction, physical, and socioeconomic characteristics. And those were uh, Watershed 263, it's up in Baltimore, and What's Brand, it's up in DC. I will quickly tell you uh, where they are located on the map. Uh, but people have often asked me about Watershed 263. But the, the, what's the name of the watershed? I would say Watershed 263. No, no, what's the name? And I said, that's the name. Um, so, yes, we do have. Um, the watershed, which is named 263. And uh, from the beginning, this is a purely qualitative research, and we try to go and get in depth understanding of what's going on in the area. And uh, that's why you might not find a lot of qualitative stuff here, but I just wanted to make that uh, known in the beginning. Uh, as I was telling you, you could see uh, to my right, it's watershed 263. It's up in Baltimore City, and that is the jurisdiction. That's the only one which is under Baltimore City. Uh, whereas what branch, it spells two jurisdictions. One is Washington, D.C. The other one is Prince George's County, sorry, um, up in Maryland. So it has two jurisdictions. So um, some part of that watershed or water uh, monitoring and management happens through D.C. and some part from now let us uh, discuss a little about the physical and socioeconomic characteristics of those two watersheds. Um, as you could see, um, the size is much, much higher in Watts Branch compared to that of Watershed 263. But in terms of percent of residential land use, uh, it is much higher in uh, Baltimore. Uh, population density is also higher compared to what branch. However, as we have seen in the recent social media and the census data, the population in uh, Baltimore City is declining. It's on decline, but when we did this study, that was the statistics. So for a comparative purpose, it's, it's higher um, than what branch. Um, then the percent of African uh, American ethnicity population is higher in Watts Branch, uh, so are the median household income and the degree, the college degree that uh, residents have. Uh, however, the percent of vacant lots, which is very important to our study, is higher in Baltimore City or Watts Branch, oh, sorry, or Watershed 263 compared to that of Watts Branch. With that background in mind, we came up with three objectives uh, specifically, and we do have a lot, many sub-objectives within that. Um, I just could get, get this one on a slide, so I got that. Okay. 
So first one was the in-depth understanding of the underlying socio-environmental issues in the water governance that facilitate or inhibit the implementation of the infrastructure as for GI, best management practices, we did in our two study partnerships. Second one was to understand the existing knowledge and perception of the GI PMPs uh, across diverse stakeholders and in terms of the sense of responsibility, barriers, community traditional outreach activities, and the future of the infrastructure, what the stakeholders thought the future is going to look like. And third one, based on our study, we wanted to provide some policy suggestions to improve the water quality in the Chesapeake area. Um, and as we know, there are so many different varieties of theories that are there to understand what's going on in terms of water management, water quality, and quantity monitoring, and stuff. But then we see that the society is in transition, not always the rules and regulations and the set of theories that we use to look at that. So we decided to go for Lurbach's transition management theory of governance, which is basically talks about different spheres of governance and how we should use these to attain the sustainability goals in cities. So according to his theory, there are four spheres. The first one is strategic, which is mostly related to the activities that are going on in the process of business development, setting up bigger goals, long-term goals, and how cities are doing in terms of that. And second one is the tactical, which is was basically the steering activities that are interest driven and related to the dominant structures of the society. The third one is operational, which is basically the actions uh, that have been conducted, which are short term, project specific, they relate to some programs and referred to as innovation. These are short term projects. And the fourth one is reflexive, which is the activities related to monitoring, assessment, and evaluation of ongoing policies, programs, projects that's going on. And this relates to the above three mentioned spheres in the French management governance. So with that background, we uh, did a community-based participatory research that approach is mostly to involve a lot of stakeholders from the beginning of your research so that they guide you and they give their feedback and they tell you um, what's going on on the ground level and we, if we have some disconnect between the theoretical perspective that we are looking at and the ground reality, if they are different. So we use a community-based participatory research approach, and then we had an advisory committee set up. We had people from uh, government, uh, policies, and residents, and university extension professional, and they were very amazing throughout this research. And then we conducted in-depth interviews with all the uh, respondents between March and November 2019, of course, with IRB approval. So we have taken 42 interviews, and uh, those were like more than one hour. Uh, we had to go to them, sit down with them, record the interviews, bring the data, transcribe it, and process it, and do the qualitative analysis. Um, besides, and I will describe those 42 respondents uh, shortly. And we also got the green infrastructure related uh, recent goals, policies, programs that are going on around in this area, which is a big beneficiary from different websites, the like government, nonprofits, and uh, so many uh, where they have that information. Uh, as I was telling you about those 42 respondents, we had about people from 33 different organizations in this area, this is a big bay region, uh, to participate. We are very lucky that they were 
very enthusiastic to participate in our study and talk to us about various aspects. And we had residents, uh, government, uh, people from government, university, nonprofit organizations, funding agencies, policymakers, and environmental activists uh, in this area. Um, but for the comparative purpose, we have divided these respondents into four groups. Um, Baltimore residents, first grad residents, and Baltimore green infrastructure professionals, and what's branch professionals. So the top four groups, just for the analysis purpose. So I'm going to talk to you about the major findings only, because it has a lot of stuff. And again, this could, this much could fit into my slide. Um, so as I was telling you from the beginning, we did the qualitative thematic analysis, and we have five things here uh, for the purpose of this presentation today. And I will be giving just the major findings among these five uh, themes. But if you have any questions on any particular theme or you want me to elaborate further on that, I would be happy to do that. Okay. So let's begin with the popular belief piece. So as you could see the mosaic plot here, um, we had about 150 BMPs um, listed by all the respondents. And as you could clearly see, the residential scale practices, and uh, of course I will describe all these types of practices and what we have included on our, all those lists. But you see that residential scale practices are uh, top the list following um, outreach, uh, cleanup, um, sorry, uh, large scale outreach and cleanup activities. And some even said that they do not manage any kind of water or stormwater, and uh, there's probably no VAPs. Um, however, the Baltimore professionals did not mention about cleanup activities as one of the VAPs compared to the same residents of Baltimore. And this could possibly be due to the fact that. Uh, Baltimore is predominantly in residential property, and people are much more involved with the cleanup activities compared to the professionals. That could be one of the reasons. Um, outreach, outreach activities were popular among both what brand professionals and residents, and uh, Baltimore residents did not consider outreach as a BMP. And during the interviews, they frequently complain about it that there is no adequate outreach activities provided by government agencies and others in that area. Um, and this is the analysis of what, as what we have included under each of those categories. Under outreach, we have community engagement, um, then we have educating people and kids, social media, camps. Marking drains, uh, laws, regulations, and policies. Under residential scale, we had rain garden, uh, rain, rain barrier, uh, cisterns, um, conservation landscape, native plants. Um, under cleanup activities, we had cleanup uh, trash, litter, gutter, uh, drain, um, debris, dead leaves, uh, and stuff like that, uh, dealing with vacant properties. Um, on the last scale, we included car bomb outs, and so on, green infrastructure, uh, stream restoration, green roof, uh, environmental site design, low impact development, um, environmental co benefits. So these were all included under large scale practices. Uh, next, moving on, uh, we wanted to know what people think about the responsibility. For example, the question was, who is responsible for water management in this area? And that has led to a lot of discussions about who is uh, actually responsible, who should be doing the stuff on the ground. And uh, as you could see from this bar graph, um, a government uh, or professionals also thought that they are responsible, 
whereas the residents also thought that they are responsible. So it is more like they understand, realize that it is their responsibility uh, to manage water. And what is happening, of course, it's different. And the only the professionals talked about property defend that because under that category, they say it all depends on the type of property that you are talking about. If it is private, it's a different uh, person is responsible compared to if it is industrial or uh, right of the way or public properties. Uh, these are some of the statistics. I'm not going to go into the details of that. But I just wanted to highlight, um, we definitely have a lot of quotes, but I just got one here, which is um, if like uh, in terms of responsibility, and I quote, the property owners, each and every one, which there are thousands of them. So they all have dramatically changed the landscape in their own way by putting in a house and living under a roof where there used to be probably forests and meadows and other developed property. This is the kind of responses uh, some people provided. Okay, now moving on, we just wanted to know the barriers and which was really huge. And, and it's just opened up my perspectives on how many and how much barriers are existing on the ground to adopt uh, to green infrastructure and to contribute to the sustainability goal of the city. Um, so as you could see from the mosaic plot, uh, we had um, six types of barriers that we have categories and I will explain all those. Uh, but just in the beginning, we have the social cultural barriers dominating the state entirely. We have institutional, then uh, maintenance, then uh, economic or financial, and technological and environmental. All these um, barriers existing. So we had about 166 uh, individual barriers. Uh, that were listed by the respondents, and we sorted those into five broader categories, as I just showed you. So, so uh, socio-cultural are uh, dominated, followed by institutional, economy, maintenance, and environmental and technological were more or less in the same page. Uh, however, we did not find many differences across the groups on each category except for what branch residents not mentioning about environmental barriers at all. Um, and of course, from the study, we figured out that BMPS adopts and it's not on the priority list of people compared to issues such as uh, crime, uh, poverty, trash. So that was more up in the list rather than any um, green infrastructure or stormwater management. And this could be due to lack of education, inadequate uh, educational and outreach activities, lack of trust in the system, and time commitment from the residents. Um, those were some of the issues that could have contributed to that. Um, now, what we included under each of those categories. So in sociocultural, we had lack of education and awareness, conflicting messaging, uh, environmental issues not being on the priority list, growing geriatric community, mistrust with the system, vacant laws, crime illegal dumping, not involving locals, uh, people resisting change, and disconnect between public agencies and people. Those are under sociocultural. Uh, under institutional, we had lack of governmental support, delay in getting permits, top-down approach of the city government, and ineffective community engagement. So uh, I could give you some examples on where uh, people said that we had to go to the office so many times just to get a permit because we wanted to install something. So we had to go through so many paperwork, uh, 
how things are happening. You go to this office, that person, and so that takes ages. So we finally decided we, we are not going to do that because there are so many obstacles, institutional barriers uh, at that point. Uh, on our economic and financial, we found like huge water bills, lack of funding, uh, financial burden on residents, and paying storm water fees. So there are places such as in Baltimore, they have a storm water fee, which could be about uh, $10 per month um, that they pay. And they do not understand why they pay that. So the majority of the population, they did talk about that. It's a huge water bill and why we should be paying storm water bill. Um, under maintenance, we had a lack of funding for maintenance, lack of maintenance, and reliance on residents for maintenance. So uh, most of the time, in any project that they are taking up or trying to implement, they do not consider the long-term maintenance, and it's not written into the project, which is very um, problematic because after a while when uh, the system starts dysfunctioning they do not know what to do so they have to abandon that uh, particular um, DMP or whatever they had already installed so that was one of the challenges and somebody let's say was giving me an example about uh, the people change people change places so let's say there was there used to be a very environmentally conscious resident who had something installed on his or her backyard. And the new person moves in and says that of this red garden, it is not looking good, even if it's native plantation and water loving, water soaking plants. Out there they don't understand. They say, Oh, it's this mosquito could be breed here. Why do I keep it and they cut it out? So that's the end of the story. So that is not, that is lacking. And for long-term maintenance, we do not have a system in place. It's mostly whoever has started doing it for the first day to continue as long as they are there. So that was a big challenge. Um, and under environmental, we had uh, trash, poor soil quality, topography not being conducive, especially in Baltimore, under the ground, so one of the officials, the two officials, uh, she was telling me that when you go to install something, let's say in this patch of land, when it, it's very old, so when you try to dig in, you find that there's no place to install anything because there will be underlying, um, you know, there are different lines that are going on or electric line or anything else. We are not aware of, so we just don't want to disturb that place. And especially when it is a residential property. So we have to uh, find other ways uh, of doing that. Under technological, we had um, scientific jargons, which is not ideal for communication, and knowledge gap, retrofitting everything that is not applicable to all the places, lack of need based solutions. So I would like to give you an example where I uh, was talking to a resident in uh, Ward 7, 6 or 7 up in DC. And uh, she is serving on the board of the big uh, environmental agency, I'm not going to tell the name. And she said, I am on the advisory board and I kind of represent the residents in Ward 7, let's say. And I go there, I sit there, they talk all the time, all the details, technicalities, statistics. They will show up cool pictures and say that, oh, this is um, the TMDL, for example, this is the TMDL limit. And she would be like, I'm like, I don't understand what's going on around me. I can't relate to whatever is happening. So if I do not understand what TMDL is, how it is affecting me or my neighborhood, how am I going to act? How am I going to understand why I'm supposed to do something? So that was quite challenging. And she is like, you can understand I'm on the advisory board. I should be having that kind of credentials to be on the on up there. And I don't understand that. So I can't talk about the neighborhood then. 
Blood is one scientific jargon. And uh, another one was retrofit. Uh, they said it's easier if we have something that we just take it, install it. It's retrofitting everything, but all the places, all the, um, uh, every system is not the same. The place differs from one to the other. So you cannot go ahead and uh, use something everywhere, uh, try to retrofit. So we need a uh, need best solution, which is not uh, um, I got some quotes here uh, on the different variants. Let me read those out to you. Um, changes are always hard. So the barrier would be people again to make changes. Uh, the barrier, language. Well, like I can only deal with the sort of government agencies because I was on the board. The language was really scientific. And I think that communication is also another issue. I think another barrier is implicit bias. It relates to like also those who are people really care, care about what we are doing. So it's more like the government saying that oh, they don't have any understanding of what we are doing. Um, so they don't care probably. That's what the other part is thinking. Um, there is so much emphasis on getting things off the ground, on drinking water, to meet a short-term goal that if you don't maintain these systems over time, they don't continue to operate. Um, a lot of locations don't really allow for infiltration because of the soils. When you are in an urban area and you want to talk about visible pollutants, nutrients, sediments, um, are very low down when you are looking at things like uh, trash, concerns about bacteria and pollution. So at that time, they say there's um, trash and others go up in the ladder of priority list compared to other things. Okay, so moving on, um, community education and outreach activities. So what are the things that are going on? So we wanted to know uh, what kind of activities or community outreach activities that you see that's going on in your neighborhood in this place. Or for the government agency, what do you uh, offer of people? How often that happens? So we uh, had a group good response on that. We had 142 responses, and it was predominantly government, followed by non-profit organizations and community level partners, uh, faith-based organizations. So there are a lot of churches and they have their green teams that they are working on different aspects. And um, six were on programs offered by University of Merit and Extensor. Yeah, we made it to the list, um, but everybody mentioned that those were not adequate. They said uh, there are a lot of issues that is going on, even if there are presence of different agencies on the neighborhood, uh, it's not adequate. And so our question was then, how do we reach the people? If you, if let's say we want to offer something tomorrow as a part of outreach activities, how do we do that? How do we get to people? And this is what we have here in the list. Um, email, listserv, talking to community, educating kids, app, um, then uh, flyers, and door-to-door -door work, um, then incentives as credits, river work, um, barbecue, food and music in the community, annual conferences, um, and uh, uh, teaching communities on maintenance, how you should be maintaining one system after um, the life. Those were some of the services that we used. And uh, here we, uh, uh, I don't think you can see the slide up there, but okay, that is the future and to attain sustainability goals. So what uh, the stakeholders fair? First of all, um, they said that uh, as long as we have water in this world, we need to manage water. So the future looks bright. We do have um, that there. 
uh, but how do we uh, uh, go there? Is how do we try to attain the sustainability goal in the future, or what you would like to see if we can do in a better way? Um, these are some of the uh, solutions that the stakeholders provided all these groups. And uh, as you can see, it's a lot. And again, this much I could just get in this slide. Um, and we do have much more, uh, a longer list. Uh, but it's mostly like changes in policy level, and that was mostly the residents. Political willingness, collective action, positive media. So in Baltimore, somebody was saying that, oh, well, in, on media, Baltimore looks like the rats infested, and we have poor this and that, mosquito infested. So it's not sending a positive message to everybody that we have a situation here at the ground level. So we need to have some positive media cancer. Um, and then uh, another one is uh, removing uh, bureaucratic hiccups, uh, resident involvement. And resident involvement uh, was one of the uh, frequently talked about solutions. And another one is green jobs. And people were really uh, optimistic about the green jobs. Uh, and somebody was just explaining me, let's say we have um, a local, the person who is living in this area is given a job, a green job. He or she understands the community better. And people will listen to him or her better than a government agency person coming and telling us what to do. Uh, so that way we can um, have more jobs and more work done in that level. Similarly, what French residents, uh, they said public engagement campaign, resiliency framework, homeowners involvement, community involvement, um, the better knowledge, green jobs again, um, that we heard up there. Uh, those were some of the ways. Uh, for the uh, for professional side, again, retrofitting, if you could see that it's it's up there in the list, and both the professionals and both the watersheds they talk about that. Uh, they also think about education and citizen engagement. And as uh, EPA has mandated. Uh, community outreach activities is one of the VATs that they have listed. So maybe because of that, we have uh, a government mandate. People are bound to do uh, community engagement activities. But as you can see, some of the pictures down here, these are from the growth centers. Um, in short, it's called GRW. It's offered by the DPW uh, of uh, uh, in Baltimore City, sorry. <clears throat> and uh, what they do <clears throat> in these uh, growth centers, they give away mulches, plants, and well, inverse human and extension also participated there. They talk to people about how to start a project, let's say, and know how and provide them all the things that they need to begin any project. And here is a picture of the tool bags of India. Um, again, Baltimore City. So, tool banks is, uh, has a lot of tools that they let the residents borrow sometimes. They also offer up that space for different activities. They also get school kids um, there and tell them how the green infrastructure is, how what way you can manage water, and uh, stuff like that. So, that, that's a great place. And they have like views, place, and Cisterns, rain barrels, and uh, raged uh, flower beds up there in the front. Um, so that that's a nice place. So it has been happening. And one of the uh, one of the officials told me, as you could see, people are picking up a mulch. Then she said, if you have a car and a sack, you can come and get one uh, sack full of mulch. We're just giving it away free. So okay, I'll think about that. So there are uh, some community engagement and activities that are going on, but probably it's not adequate on the time. So going back to where we started about transition management, 
we saw that all of the activities that are happening, at least on the government side, it is largely driven by the Clean Water Act. But we know the Clean Water Act was in 1972, if I'm not wrong. And uh, ever since then, we didn't have a lot of changes to that act. Only in 2019, we have Water Infrastructure Improvement Act, which is, of course, very recent. So we don't know how it is going to change the landscape, the issue that is going on. But it's it's there, and uh, all the other resultant regulation, local levels such as NS4 permit or TMDL limits, they were from the Clean Water Act. Whatever they are offering up is largely driven by those acts. And tactical, we saw that there are a lot of activities which are carried out by different stakeholders there, but uh, clearly it is not enough. It's uh, we need to do a lot more there. Under operational, we found uh, residential scale PMPs were the uh, dominant ones and uh, could be because of the properties or the places are heavily residential scale, uh, privately owned. And in uh, the reflexive, we found that for sociocultural barriers was the dominant barrier and one needs to address that. Uh, although we have the presence of different agencies in terms of outreach activities, we need more targeted and go a little bit out there. So in conclusion, we know that globally, clean water is a significant challenge for all the expanding cities. Achieving the sustainability goals is still challenging, and we need a concerted effort there. Um, and as we saw, society is transitioning, but not the rules and regulations. They stay the same, same over a period of time, as we just saw in the Mother Act, 1972 and 2019. And as uh, Professor Silmo was mentioning in the beginning, social acceptance is of paramount importance. If we have technology and science uh, very robust ones in place, but if it is not accepted by people, it's not going to fly. It's not going to um, you know, have any good you know, implications out of that. So based on our uh, research, we provided some policy suggestions. So along with long-term planning, we want policymakers to introduce its trends and management governance and be more inclusive, collaborative, and involve stakeholders from the beginning. Because it's if we so what is missing is this uh, inclusion and respect part of this. Because uh, most of the time the residents feel that we have been living here for ages, our forefathers, our grandparents, and everybody was here. And all of a sudden, one person comes and tells us that you need to install this one because we need to get an S4 permit. I don't understand why I should be doing that. So that uh, involvement uh, is very important from the beginning. If they are on the same side, uh, when you are starting the planning process, that would be wonderful. And more meaningful outreach activity using modern technology um, is also needed. And uh, uh, addressing the sociocultural barriers, as we discussed as well, um, are important, as well as the residents also so we need to take up um, some responsibility of collective access um, to help. And we would suggest having more uh, studies in the future using community-based participatory research approach to involve stakeholders from the beginning and uh, have meaningful partnership there. We just uh, recently published this one, and as you could see, our team here. Um, so uh, this is a nice publication. And if you get time, uh, please uh, go through that. And uh, we have much more. Whatever I presented is a fraction of the paper. But if you get the chance, I would love to uh, get your feedback on the paper. 
and acknowledgements. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's an NSA funded project, and Professor Paul Wiesnack is the AI of the project. And um, of course, uh, Professor Simon Madi is here for the huge part uh, of the whole project. And uh, I would like to thank the community advisory board members uh, for their help throughout. Our community partners who were written into the grant from the beginning. Uh, Parks and People Foundation and Blue Water Baltimore up in Baltimore side and Anacostia Watershed Society in, in DC. They were very, very helpful um, for me to go to the neighborhoods and conduct the interviews with the stakeholders. And finally, uh, last but not the least, the respondents for their overwhelming participation uh, in the interviews. Okay, with that, I would like to thank you all for listening, and it's up to Jared and Martina. Thank you. So, you know, the emerging theme was kind of the community input and the challenge, and everybody wants green jobs, but, you know, if they don't have a job, then they may not get, you know, they may not understand the value right they need a job and um i was wondering if you had anything you know in my experience of just having green infrastructure put in my community versus you know being in this department um most of the people who do the green infrastructure installment they do it all over the dc baltimore area it's a company who might come to Hyattsville and then they would go to baltimore and then they would go to dc they build a rain garden and then they go to the next place and so there really isn't a job for that place because that's just one of the jobs that they're doing, you know, every month they're in a different place installing another rain garden. Um, so how do you, and even in my own neighborhood, again, when they come in, they come in and do it and they're gone, you never see them, you know, they're gone. A few weeks later, there's no community input. And so how do you kind of think about the infrastructure of a lot of our students graduate as environmental consultants, our undergrads, and a part of that where you just kind of go from job to job, where do you have the community buy-in or the community job or the community, you know, kind of in input when the way environmental consulting businesses are kind of established and made, you don't really have that as part of their business model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful question, thank you. So what happens is any any job or consultancy, as you said, um, they are hired by somebody. They are paid for their work, whatever they are doing. So let's say our neighborhood pays for the maintenance of things and installations of things and maintenance over a period of time or those kind of things. But then in these kind of communities, where they're like underprivileged, uh, nobody is hiring somebody to do that job. So most of the time what happens is the government agencies or representatives, they go for community outreach activities, have a table, they talk to people. Mostly that you can install this practice in your neighborhood, or we can help you have a rent garden, rent garden, or system given. We can tell you the know-how, you do it. So it's basically the residents who are doing that in those places. It's so they're, they're just getting, of course, a little help, but there are challenges. If somebody is trying to do that from their side, they have to go to the office, get the permit, and it's a big challenge. So at the middle of the way, they're saying, oh, it's not worth it. We are not going to do that. Why would I spend so much of time? And uh, sometimes we feel that, or you know, somewhere, some people think that probably the people in that underserved community, they're just sitting right there, not doing anything. But then let's say have a job. Besides that, if somebody's trying to do that, it's really wonderful. Uh, but they're not getting that kind of support. For example, places where they provide some kind of rebate. Because of that process is so challenging, people do not want to take that in there. They say, forget it. I will just do it whatever I'm uh, paying for my backyard or front yard. I'm going to uh, take that 
I'm not going to go to the office, show them the pictures, and after a while, again, show them what is the different uh, development or the process that has happened, and um, just get some money or regret for my water bills or something. I'm not going to get into there. So most of the time, this job, so what they feel that if you create a job in the neighborhood, let's say you come and identify one person. Okay, you have been very active and uh, can you take care of this whole place? We are going to give you a job. And if you have a steady job, of course, you will be going through the neighborhood convincing people that this needs to be done, this needs to be installed. I'm going to help you. If there are some challenges in terms of maintenance, uh, there is somebody that they can lean on. Okay, um, somebody is going to help us around in that neighborhood. So the trust and partnership will increase much more. Hope I answered the question. Yes. Um, so I wanted to ask a question about um, when you all were interviewing the residents. Um, was there a question in your um, in your list that asked the residents what they wanted or what they felt their community needed? Because I know a lot of the obstacles that exists between industries, agencies, and communities and their engagement is a group coming to them saying, you need this, we're going to help you do it, versus coming to that neighborhood saying, what can we do for you? And then that being the first step to get them to buy in. And then when they come back, you know, the agency come back and say, well, this is kind of what you need. <laughs> Mm -hmm. They're a little bit more willing to say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So is that one of the questions that you all ask the residents, kind of like preliminary, what do you think your community needs? Yes. Just to say. As far as best management practices or just clean up or just, um, you know, generally speaking for their environment where they currently are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an awesome question. And we did ask. As you go see from here, what do they want in the future? And you see those stakeholders group their residents. So we did ask them, as well as the government side, what they want and what are the challenges that they are facing as well. Uh, to go to the community and talk to people in general. At the same time, what the residents. Uh, and uh, good thing is we had about a half of the sample you know, of what we do. Uh, no, we had 20 residents. And that. So we had our uh, 10 in each of those watersheds. So we just went to the communities and talked to them in their own setting where they uh, spoke about you know different aspects of that one. Oh, so, so half of the respondents were residents and the other half were residents. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we had quite a big number of residents there. Uh, Yes, I think at the beginning of your talk, you talked about the percentages of vacant lot space and the one that was the Baltimore one that was really high. 30, yes. 30 percent, maybe. Yes. Which which does seem really high. And I guess I was wondering, I guess, first of all, is that commercial or residential vacant lots? Who's responsible for maintaining the vacant lots and how the vacant lots affect maybe public perception of their community. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, thanks for asking. And that was one of my questions when I went about me. I was trying to understand what vacant lots are. So what happens is sometimes uh, it's owned by residents. They just abandon it to move to a new place. Then uh, they have the ownership, but they don't show up. Um, then sometimes there is something called the uh, adopt a lot uh, in, in a program that the EPW runs. What they do is they give a vacant lot on lease to somebody nearby the neighborhood. It's especially the residents live nearby um, to develop that property. So there will be like a, they will clean up trash, they will have all these plantations, beautiful flowers. And some people even give uh, us uh, examples of uh, movie screen in those places. So they will build up 
some of the uh, you know benches, cement benches, and all. And this is all done by the residents on the voluntary basis. Nobody is you know, paying it. So they take it on lease, they develop it. Sometimes, like it's not means I don't have the statistics, but it's just could be one or two cases. But what happens is once they develop that part, then the government comes and tries to sell it. That's it. Because it is developed, they can get a better price. And they do not say that to the uh, people those were taking care of that. So they have the lease for so many years only. And after that, they need to either renew it or just you know have nothing to do with that. So it's a huge amount. Huge. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Potter, for interesting. You're answering questions, so uh, we need to be sort of faithful to our hours. So we're going to draw things to a close. Thank you all for being and being here, and thank you to those that have tuned in as well. Uh, we will also get this posted. Uh, Thank you.